all of us, and that is the idea that I'm not good enough, that I don't have anything to contribute because God could never use me because of all the sin that I have accumulated in my life. I want you to think about for a moment a beautiful vase. It's an ornate vase. It is aesthetically pleasing to the eye. It serves no purpose but just to sit on a shelf and to be beautiful. Think about another vase. This vase is not quite as beautiful. In fact, it has a lot of cracks in it. Looks like it's barely being held together. It's a vase that looks worn out, like it's been buried under the earth for, for many years. And the truth of the matter is, it is astronomically more valuable than the first one because of what it contains on the inside. You see, that beautiful vase that you see there that's very ornate, it's very beautiful, you can buy at Target, you can buy at Walmart, it's really of not any great value whatsoever. This one, however, is unearthed by archaeologists who found it containing some very rare artifacts, and so therefore it is of higher value, much more higher value than the one that you see that is more ornate and beautiful. But this is how our society places worth on things. Our society views something as beautiful, ornate, aesthetically pleasing to the eye as being more valuable. If you are talented, if you are wealthy, if you have affluence, then you are valuable. Society looks at what's on the outside rather than looking at what's on the inside. But we are more like this vase. We are that unimpressive vase in that what you see on the outside may not be all that beautiful. It may not be all that aesthetically pleasing, but it's what's on the inside as a child of God that makes our, our worth so grand. It makes our value so great. It seems as though in our world today, you don't have to do much to be valuable. If you're pretty, then you're worth a lot. If you're ugly, then sorry. If you are someone who has the right proportions or the right ratios, especially as a woman, if you have many curves and you are considered to be beautiful, but if you're overweight or obese, sorry, you're not worth much. Unless you are somebody who has a lot of money, because money seems to trump everything, right? You can be somebody that's not very pretty, that's not very slim, but if you have a lot of, uh, of money, then you can be valuable anyway. We also see that if you have talents or abilities to the extreme, that you could be considered very valuable. I mean, let's be honest here. How many professional athletes have you seen walking around with a beautiful woman on their arm and you're thinking to yourself, there's no way he could have ever gotten that woman in real life if he couldn't play baseball or football, right? Because talent and ability seems to draw people. It makes you worth something in our society. And we know this. We understand it. We don't like it but we get it. And because we understand it, because we may even despise it, we still buy into it and we try to cover up our cracks. We try to mask those things that are flaws in our lives because we don't want anyone to see and therefore think that we are worth less than what we are. While we may not agree with society's outlook, we still conform. And so what happens when we don't measure up? What happens when we don't fit society's view or measure up to their standard? Well, some resort to bad behavior. Some may develop an eating disorder. Some may even go as far as to commit suicide. But at the very least, our self-image is damaged. We may close ourselves off from the rest of society and develop some unhealthy habits because we don't want others to see our flaws or our cracks. And we see something very similar in the church. Many of us are wearing masks. We come in with our best suits on, our best ties, our best dresses, whatever it is, but inwardly we're falling apart. We mask it, we cover it up because we don't want people to think that we don't have it all together and that perhaps we are falling apart. We have this insane idea that to be a faithful child of God, I have to first clean up my act. That in order for God to accept me, I have to first get my life right and remove all the flaws and to cover up all the cracks. Think about how many people 
avoid a relationship with God because they feel they are beyond the point of saving. I mean, think about it. How many times have you heard somebody make this statement? Well, I've just done too much wrong. God could never forgive me for all the wrong that I have done. How many of us have been hindered by our past and refused to move forward and accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because we believe that he doesn't want us, that we are too tarnished, that we are not aesthetically pleasing to him. How many have found themselves unequipped, unable, because of a poor self-image? Like Moses, many feel that God has gotten the wrong candidate, that God has chosen the wrong purpose, uh, person to carry out his purpose. Speaking of Moses, I want you to notice what God says to him when Moses offers up his first excuse. Verses 10 through 12 of Exodus chapter 3, it says, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, certainly I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Now I think Moses demonstrates a poor self-image here, right? Or a lowly self-concept. Because he's coming up with these excuses, he believes that God has made a wrong choice in choosing him. But God says, Certainly, I will be with you. That's all that Moses needed to hear. Should have been, anyway. Should have been all he needed to hear, and, and that should have focused him and, and helped him to move forward. The fact that God will be with you is all that we should ever have to hear to help us step out in faith. But God chose the right person. He chose Moses for a reason, but Moses wouldn't buy in, at least not at first. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, Beginning in verse 11, we see the angel of the Lord visit Gideon with a message and a mission. There it reads, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizurite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh. And I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Gideon had his ready-made excuses when the Lord approached him. He definitely suffered from a low self-image or a lack of self-esteem. It seems as though Gideon had lost faith and had lost hope, and he runs down the list of reasons why God had picked the wrong guy. You know, my tribe is not known for its strength. I'm the least in my father's house. I'm not the right guy, Lord. But it should have been enough for Gideon to understand that God had chosen him. And because God had chosen him, he was completely qualified for the task. God had heard it all before. Moses said, who am I? Now Gideon questioned, how can I? But God had heard it before. What both of them needed to realize is that their questions, their excuses were valid if left on their own, but they weren't left to themselves. God was going to be with them. In fact, he would be driving them, and therefore, with faith, they could step out, knowing that they could be and do something great in this life. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 1 and following, we read these words. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of jo uh, Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. 
I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Seems as though Jeremiah thought God had made a wrong choice. I'm not the man for the, for the job, God. I, I, I'm too young. I don't know how to speak. And God reassures Jeremiah that he is the man for the job because you know what? I chose you even before you were born. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You were made for this, Jeremiah. And you're going to do my job. You're going to accomplish my mission because I am behind it. And that should have been all he needed to hear. And of course, as we see with Jeremiah, he went forward trying to accomplish the mission, the mission that God had set forth for him. You may not seem like much in your own estimation. You may feel like that you are not worth a whole lot based on your own standard or based on the standard of society. But to God, you are priceless. In God's eyes, you are somebody that is invaluable. And that's really all that should matter to us. Far too many folks have based their self-worth on the flimsy standard of society. Self-esteem is often tied to these things that we've already mentioned, like abilities or talents or looks or affluence or whatever it may be. But what happens when Superman is confined to a wheelchair? What happens when that supermodel becomes super overweight or super old? What happens when that super company that you work for, having invested all of your time in, has a super layoff? What then? What happens when everything that you have invested your life in is taken away or falls apart? What then? Where do you get your feelings of self-worth? Where do you get your self-image from? You see, these things are fleeting. These things don't truly matter. Because it's not about what you are on the outside, but rather what you contain on the inside. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the state school here in Abilene. I took a tour, and let me tell you what I saw that day. I saw individuals who were unable to get out of bed, unable to speak, unable to even move. Some of them didn't have control over their bodily functions. Some of these people would never know any relationship other than the one that they had with their caretakers. Some of them would never earn a living. By society's standard, what were they worth? Not much. In fact, there's a push in our society to do away with people like that. You realize that? To maybe euthanize them and, and rid the world of, of these people who, who pose such a, such a detriment to society and are, are so hard to take care of. See, I believe differently. I believe that these people are a real blessing. I believe that God can help us to understand through these people what it means to take care of someone, to love someone who has absolutely no ability to love you back or to, to give back. They can love in their way, but you see what I'm saying? I believe these people can teach us what it means to show unconditional true love to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. I believe that in God's eyes, they are worth just as much as you and I. I believe that he sees them as, as being priceless as well. One of the nurses I, I talked to, I said, you know, you are such a blessing to these people's lives, all that you do. And she quickly corrected me and said, no, they are a blessing to me in my life. We've got to get to the point to where we see past the exterior, that we see past how society judges and views people, and to see people for what they have on the inside and see people the way that God sees them. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18 and 4, Behold, all souls are mine. And so, for those of you who feel that you are not valuable to God, for those of you who feel that you are not of any worth to God, allow me to take a few moments this morning to persuade you differently. I'll tell you first and foremost, you're wrong. You could not be more wrong. But I know just telling you that doesn't accomplish much. I'm going to have to show you. And so for the few moments we have left, I'm going to show you how you are priceless 
to God, even though you may consider yourself as worthless. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You ever thought about how that implies a healthy self-concept? To love your neighbor as yourself? I mean, the implication is clear that you are to love yourself, right? Now, obviously, there's two extremes. You know, one extreme is that you're self-deprecating, that you have a very poor self-image, that you're self-loathing. But the other extreme is that you can strut sitting down, that you're someone that is just puffed up and arrogant all the time. You don't want to be either one of those extremes. Obviously, you want to be somewhere in the middle, someone who has a healthy self-concept. Understand that the only accurate barometer for determining self-worth is the divine vantage point. Doesn't matter how society sees you. Doesn't really matter even, ultimately, how you see yourself, but how God sees you. Society can be wrong, and all too often they are. You can be wrong in your own assessment of yourself, and all too often we are wrong in how we assess ourselves. Society's standard, our own standard sometimes, is a black hole. We've got to see past the outer coating and see what's on the inside because we know that the Lord's assessment doesn't focus on the outwardly. 1 Samuel 16 and 7, God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Kings 8 and 39, the Lord knows the hearts of all the sons of men. We are totally and completely transparent before God. Hebrews 4 and 13 reads, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The book of Acts chapter 1 verse 24, it states, You, Lord, who know the hearts of men. Our Lord is the heart knower. He knows everything about you, inside and out, every crevice, every nook and cranny of your being, right? Self-worth has little to do with the superficial and has everything to do with the spiritual. God knows you. He knows everything about you. Why? Because he created you. You are his creation. On the sixth day of creation week, God said these words, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1, it reads, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then on down in verse 31, it states, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. He created you and he looked upon his creation and thought that it was very good. Man was made in the very image of God himself. Now, we know that that image is not physical because God is a spirit being. And we understand that that image has to do with spiritual qualities. But I say all that to say this. Our personal worth is inseparably tied to the fact that we were made by God. Your life is uniquely framed and stamped with the image of the Almighty. God loves you simply because he created you. He created you, and therefore, you have great worth. Creation establishes your value. Those of you who have small children or had small children, there are probably many occasions when they came home from school where they had colored a picture or painted a picture for you, and you looked at it, and you had no idea what it was. You know, it wasn't a Picasso or a Rembrandt, except maybe it was a Picasso and the eyes were on the side of their face or something, you know. But you looked at it and you praised them. It didn't matter how good or bad you thought it was, you praised them. You hung it on the refrigerator so everybody could see it as they walked in. And the reason why is because they created it. Your child created it and therefore it was valuable to you. Some of the best Christmas gifts or birthday gifts I've ever gotten have been something that my, my daughters or my son created. You come in my office, there, there's a picture frame on my wall, and my, my oldest daughter, Keely, had this wonderful idea last Christmas to get all of my sermon titles out of the bulletins and clip them off and make a collage. It's one of the best gifts I've ever gotten. Didn't cost her much to make it, but it is a priceless value because it came from her, right? Their creation means something to us because they are our creation. Whatever they do, you know, it pleases us, except, of course, when they choose to disobey but even then, we love them. We cherish them. Some of you may be saying to yourself, I know that God created me. I know that I'm his creation, but I've all but messed up that creation. I know that he once looked upon his creation and said that it was very good, but I'm not good. I can never be, I can never be saved because I've just gone too far off the deep end. 
That is sin talking, folks. That is Satan talking. That is him rattling around in your head trying to keep you from living the life that God intends for you to live. Sin decimates our self-worth. It causes an inward struggle within ourselves. It causes this own civil war within us. It causes us to think lowly of ourselves. It causes us to have our self-esteem destroyed. Sin can debilitate us to the point that we feel like we are worthless and of no value to God. It can stunt our spiritual growth, and it can even lead us to say, why try? What's the use? Why even move forward? Like the words of David in Psalm 51 when he stated, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In Psalm 32 when he says, My body is heavy upon me. My, my vitality was drained away with the fever heat of summer. Many of us have had our vitality drained away. We have no more zeal, no more passion because sin has knocked us so low. We feel like we can't move forward. We feel like that we are destined to stay at rock bottom. How sad that is. As difficult as, we, as it may be, we must fight to not let sin define us. Sin may have knocked you down. You may have sinned greatly in your life. But you don't have to be sin. It doesn't have to identify you. That doesn't have to be your identity. We need to stop allowing sin to define us and start allowing God to redeem us. In Romans 5, starting in verse 8, it reads, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Have you ever looked at it that way? Have you ever considered that he loved you while you were an enemy? In fact, that's the very reason why he came to die on a cross, so that you could be redeemed. You say to yourself, well, I'm not good enough. You're right, you're not. You never will be. But what does that mean anyway? What does it mean to be good enough? See, society sets this standard of what is good. The Bible tells us no one's good, right? No one's righteous, not even one. What does it mean to be good? That's a sliding scale. Everybody has a different opinion of what is good. It's subjective. God loves us in spite of the fact that we're not good. Even while we were enemies, Christ died for us. 1 John 3 and 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God and such we are. You may not think too highly of yourself. You may have a low estimation of yourself. You may consider yourself as less than zero, but understand that in God's view, you are priceless. And if you want to debate this fact, I kindly point you to the direction of the cross. God provided a way, a means for us to be saved even while we were yet enemies by sending his son to die a cruel death on a cruel cross. And you think of what he had to endure. You think of the flogging, the beatings. You think of the spitting in his face, the crown of thorns, the spikes driven through his wrists and his feet, a slow death basically by asphyxiation. Why would somebody do something like that? There's only one explanation. It's love. Because he loves us that much. Titus 3, 5 through 7, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. God's undying love for his creation, those made in his image, would not allow him to sit idly by and watch as sin destroyed us. Something had to be done. If God had reasoned like us, he might have said, you know, these people don't deserve this. They've done too much wrong. But he doesn't reason like us. He doesn't think like we do. The cross, my friends, establishes your value. Christ died for you. Even though you are unworthy, even though you don't deserve it, even though you feel as you are nothing, even when you were openly defiant and an enemy, he died for you. So that you could go from being this tarnished looking vase to being something that is beautiful, something that is ornate, something that is aesthetically pleasing. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how great a sinner you think you are. 
Don't cheapen the cross by suggesting that you are beyond saving. Paul said that he was the chief of sinners, so you can't have that title. That title doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Paul. So therefore, quit thinking too lowly of yourself and start allowing God to redeem you. Consider the cross anytime you start to feel that you are less than zero. Consider that you were created, first of all, and then consider that someone died for you so that you could have eternal life. Who would do such a thing? Jesus Christ. Let's review the facts. The facts are this. Creation establishes your value. The very fact that God created you signifies that you have value. And the cross establishes your value. The very fact that Jesus Christ came and died on a cross proves your worth. Now, these are the facts. These are irrefutable. So please don't say to me, I can never be saved by God. I can never find salvation through Jesus Christ because I've done too much wrong. Don't say that to me because it's wrong. And you are absolutely false in stating that. You've got a decision to make based on the facts. Are you going to wallow in self-pity? Or are you going to do something about it? Are you going to step up, step out in faith, and live the life that God expects you to live as a true follower. You can talk all you want about how unworthy you are, but like we mentioned with Moses, with Jeremiah, with Gideon, if left on your own, you are unworthy. You're never going to be good enough, and you're never going to accomplish anything, but this is not about you. This is about what God can do through you. This is about what you can do when you surrender your life to Christ and say, you know what? He saved a guy like Paul. Certainly, he can save somebody like me. If he can take a man who persecuted Christians, who oversaw their deaths, and turn him into a proclaimer of the gospel, the greatest missionary there ever was, then certainly he can save you. Don't sell my God short by saying that you are beyond help and beyond saving. Don't cheapen the cross by suggesting that you are not worth anything to God. How many of you know what Craigslist is? Ever heard of Craigslist? Craigslist is a, is a website you can go to for classified ads. You can post things there to sell. You obviously buy things as well. We actually sold our last vehicle on Craigslist. What you don't normally find on Craigslist are human beings for sale. But that's what happened a few years ago when a man from Spokane, Washington decided he couldn't afford his four-year-old son anymore. He listed him on Craigslist for sale for $5,000. He said that the mother was out of the picture and he just couldn't afford him anymore. That he doesn't necessarily eat his vegetables, but he's a pretty good kid. And if you'd like to purchase him, contact him at this, at this number. Now, obviously, this gentleman got into some serious trouble and not supposed to post children on Craigslist. And so, obviously, that's a, a sad commentary on parenting in our society today as well. But I want to make this point. If you were to be listed on Craigslist or another similar site, what would you go for? What would be your worth? What would you sell for? What would people pay to buy you? Well, most of us would probably set the price pretty low, right? Most of us think that we're probably worth less than what we really are. But the truth of the matter is, whatever our estimation is, no matter how low it is, no matter how self-loathing we may be, no matter what we estimate our worth at, we've got to see ourselves the way that God sees us. As someone with priceless value, as someone who was worth creating, and someone who was worth saving. If you're sitting here this morning and you are not a child of God, and you, before you grab your songbooks, just listen. If you're sitting here this morning and you're not a child of God, and you've been using the reasoning that you're not good enough, toss that aside because that won't work. Come in faith, being immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Take advantage of that, that awesome sacrifice that Christ gave on your behalf. If you are a child of God, and perhaps you have not been a true follower, 
you have not been living the Christian life as you should, maybe sin has decimated you and you need to get back on track, then we want to pray, we want to help you this morning. This is a time of new beginnings. Every time a new year rolls around, we talk about resolutions and new beginnings and things of that nature. What better way to start the new year than by getting on track or by giving your life to Christ? Whatever your need is, come now as we stand and as we sing.